You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side of history. My name is Steve Silverman, and today's story is titled Operation Body Snatch. But before we do that, let's start with today's question of the day. And for today's question of the day, I thought I'd ask you about breakfast cereals. Now, those of you that are news junkies like me may have seen a bit of a stink a few weeks ago over whether our beloved Cap'n Crunch was really a captain or not. Now, I have to admit that Cap'n Crunch was not my favorite breakfast cereal growing up. I happen to have loved Super Sugar Smacks. After all, you can never have enough sugar for breakfast. Uh, So my question for you today is quite simple. What is Cap'n Crunch's full name? Here are your choices in alphabetical order. Was it 1. Christopher Columbus Crunch, 2. Ferdinand Erickson Crunch, 3. Horatio Magellan Crunch, 4. Hudson LaSalle Crunch, or 5. Matthew Joliet Crunch? Again, what is Captain Crunch's full name? Is it 1. Christopher Columbus Crunch, 2. Ferdinand Erickson Crunch, 3. Horatio Magellan Crunch, 4. Hudson LaSalle Crunch, or 5. Matthew Joliet Crunch. And as always, I'll let you ponder over this question, and I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. And now for today's story titled, Operation Body Snatch. And this story begins on April 27th of 1945. That's just three days before Adolf Hitler's suicide. And on this day, seven members of the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps, they were searching the northern reaches of Germany's Thuringian Forest. This is basically the middle of nowhere. They were looking for hidden ammo dumps. And that's when they stumbled across a salt mine in Burnt Road that had been used as a munitions manufacturing and storage facility. Now to provide you with a bit of census of the size of this mine, let me just tell you that one reached it by taking an elevator down 1,800 feet. That's about a third of a mile or a half a kilometer from the surface. And once down there, the men found an estimated 400,000 tons of stored ammo in its estimated 14 miles or 23 kilometers of tunnels. Now, these guys were sure that they found the mother load, but there was an even bigger surprise in store for them. About a quarter of a mile or four-tenths of a kilometer from the elevator shaft, the soldiers stumbled across a side passageway that appeared to be sealed off with fresh cement. So curiosity got the better of them, and they decided to find out what was behind that newly mortared wall. So they tunneled an opening through an estimated six feet or two meters of masonry and rubble, and what they found on the other side was simply astounding. It was a room that had been partitioned off into bays that were filled with artwork, boxes, and tapestries. There was an estimated 225 Prussian flags and banners that were hanging unfurled. More importantly, all this stuff surrounded four coffins, one of which was adorned with a large wreath and red ribbons with swastikas and bore the name Adolf Hitler. You know what they were thinking. Holy cow, we just found the body of Adolf Hitler. But of course, as history would show, they had not. But upon closer inspection, they noticed that someone had quickly scribbled a few words in red crayon onto each casket. Now, three of these were the remains of Germany's most celebrated rulers. That's King Frederick Wilhelm I, King Frederick the Great, and Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg. The fourth casket belonged to Frau von Hindenburg. It was later learned that these remains had been placed down in the mine just three weeks earlier. And that's because the Russians were closing in on Potsdam, which was the location of the Tannenberg Memorial. You see, the Nazis feared that the Russians would destroy not just the monument, but also the remains that were buried there, those of Hindenburg and his wife. So they quickly removed the caskets and blew up the remaining sarcophagi, ultimately finding their way, along with the two Fredericks, to the Burn to Road mine. It has been theorized that this room deep in the mine was set up to preserve the most precious artifacts of German military history, 
because it was clear that the Germans were going to lose the war, and this would preserve them for the next rise of the German Reich. The job of getting these four coffins and all the associated regalia up and out of the mine became the responsibility of the M, F, A, and A, or the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives branch of the military. This is a group of 345 art historians, museum directors, architects, educators, and curators that hailed from 13 different countries. Now, they're better known today as the Monuments Men, and they're the subject of a soon-to-be-released George Clooney movie. But their chief goal was to preserve all of the treasures plundered by the Nazis during World War II. The coffins were the last objects to be removed from the mine. Frau von Hindenburg had the lightest casket, and she was the first one to take the 14-minute ride up to the surface. Next was Frederick Wilhelm I, and that was followed by Field Marshal von Hindenburg. The last coffin, however, was not going to return to the surface easily. Frederick the Great's casket was massive, and it weighed over half a ton. In addition to being incredibly difficult to maneuver, it wouldn't fit into the elevator car. But as everyone knows, what goes up must come down. And in this case, it was the reverse. What went down in the elevator should surely be able to come back up by the elevator. And it did with just inches to spare. To the surprise of the men accompanying Frederick the Great on his journey skyward, as they approached the surface, they could hear a radio blasting the Star Spangled Banner. And that was followed by God Save the King. Germany had just surrendered the war. And this is generally where the story ends in most books. But in my case, since I tend to gravitate towards the more obscure, this is the point where my research had really started. That's because I found the story of what happened to these caskets after they left the mine to be far more interesting than what occurred up to that point. You see, these four caskets created an incredible dilemma for the U.S. Army. Three of the four caskets belonged to men that played a significant role in Germany's military history. So they couldn't be reburied in just any ordinary way. But on the other hand, to give each a grand burial, you know, with an ornate tombstone or monument, that could help bring the Nazi party back to life. So the army did what others would do in a situation like this. They basically said, this is not our problem, and they quickly passed the responsibility on to higher-ups in Washington, D.C. And since the U.S. government is dealing with the bodies of foreign dignitaries, the issue is deferred to the State Department. That's the branch of the government that deals with international relations. It made sense. And just what did the State Department do with the bodies? I'm sure you won't be surprised by this. They did absolutely nothing. For an entire year, the coffins did not move from the guarded storage location, which was in the basement of a castle in Marburg. Ultimately, it was decided that these bodies were of historical importance, and therefore they should be treated just like any other historical treasure or artwork that had been plundered during the war. So this top-secret reinterment of the bodies once again became the responsibility of the Monuments Men. Three officers were assigned to the task. They were Theodore Heinrich, Francis Billido, and Everett Leslie Jr. And it was Leslie that coined the name of this top secret mission that was Operation Body Snatch, or sometimes referred to in paperwork as Operation B. Their instructions were fairly straightforward. The two kings were to be reburied in the U.S. controlled zone Greater Hesse while the two Hindenburgs would be buried near Hanover in the British zone. Why Hanover? That's because Hindenburg had requested that he be buried on his family plot there. But it was Hitler who decided to override his final wishes and have his remains placed at the Tannenberg Memorial. You see, the U.S. was simply trying to respect Hindenburg's wishes, but it was not to be. The British government wanted nothing to do with the bodies. Word came back from London that they would not allow the bodies into their zone under any condition. Okay, 
since burying the Hindenburgs in a place they had chosen was clearly out of the question, the three monuments men decided to focus their energy on the two kings instead. And the solution seemed really straightforward. The kings were Hohenzollerns, so why not bury them on one of the properties that was still owned by their descendants? But this also proved to be problematic. You see, after their great loss in World War I, the Hohenzollerns now only owned two pieces of land in Germany. One was being used as lodging for French troops, so there was no way to bury two kings in secret there. And the second was Berg Hohenzollern Castle, but it was located in the French-controlled zone, and like the British, the French said, no way. So they couldn't be buried in the British or the French zones. So it became clear that all four bodies need to be buried somewhere in the U.S. zone. And since all four of these corpses were of the Protestant faith, it seemed logical to bury them in a Protestant church. But that idea quickly fizzled after it was determined that all of the suitable Protestant churches were either badly damaged or totally destroyed during the war. The next step of the Three Monuments men was to see if they could find a place, you know, any place that had even the slightest connection to the Hohenzollern family. And after careful research, the Kronberg Castle near Frankfurt seemed like the perfect fit. And once again, luck was not on their side. The Monuments Men, Theodore Heinrich in particular, had a much bigger problem thrown onto their plate. You see, someone had stolen the jewels that had been hidden in the Kronberg Castle. They were valued at $7.6 million in 1947, or get this, $77 million today. And the great mystery of this theft focused worldwide attention onto the castle. And that's certainly not the place you want to have a secret reburial of nobility. So their search for a suitable burial ground continued, but they were having no luck. For example, a former Hohenzollern summer castle, it had a chapel but it lacked a burial crypt. And then another small castle was found to have been badly damaged during the war. And yet another was ruled out because its current owner, he forbid the digging because it would have meant possible damage to, get this, it would have damaged his prized rhododendrons. Ultimately, the answer they had been seeking was hidden right under their noses, St. Elizabeth's Church in Marburg. The church had survived the war in fairly good shape, and it lied just a few hundred yards from where the bodies were currently being stored. But the real question was whether or not the church had any space left to bury the bodies. You see, the church was built way back in 1235, and the odds were that every single bit of available real estate may have been occupied by others. The three officers spent a considerable amount of time searching through the church's burial records to locate possible burial spots. It was decided that the two Fredericks would be buried below the floor of the north transept, while the Hindenburgs would find final rest at the base of its north tower. Before moving forward with their plan, the descendants of both families were consulted to seek their approval. The French would not allow Crown Prince Wilhelm, who was the eldest son of Germany's last emperor, to leave their zone. So a letter notifying him that his eldest daughter Cecilia, along with Captain Leslie, that they would be coming to see him was sent in advance. And when they showed up, the Crown Prince refused to give permission. Why? Because he thought that Captain Leslie was coming to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. But once the misunderstanding was cleared up, he wholeheartedly gave his permission for the reburial to take place. And getting Hindenburg family approval didn't go smoothly either. You see, they were to meet his only son Oscar in Wiesbaden, but he was a no-show. It turns out that he'd been arrested by American security police for signing a Wiesbaden hotel register with his full military title. But once released, Hindenburg was taken to St. Elizabeth's, and he granted his family's approval for the reburial plan. Digging of the two burial plots added another wrinkle to this ongoing saga. 
While excavating the hole for the two kings, workers uncovered the remains of undocumented pre-Reformation monks. They didn't know that the bodies were there. Their remains were gently moved aside, and that left just enough space for the two caskets to fit in. In the Hindenburg's case, workers hit bedrock at a depth of two feet or two-thirds of a meter. And since using explosives in an old church like St. Elizabeth's was clearly out of the question, they took the advice of a local architect who recommended elevating the church's floor by several steps in the area around the coffins. The four bodies were finally laid to rest on August 19th of 1946. That's 479 days after they were first discovered deep down in that Thuringian mine. Now, there was a fear that fanatics were going to steal the bodies, so the graves were covered with steel plates and then a layer of concrete. Large sandstone blocks weighing in at two tons apiece were placed over each gravesite with the names and the dates of its personages chiseled in. The Hindenburgs are still buried there to this day. In September of 1952, the caskets of the two kings were moved once again. This time, they were taken to the Hohenzollern Castle in Heckingen, where a family spokesman declared they were to remain, quote, until Germany is united again and they can return to Potsdam. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, the decision was made to do just that. On August 17th of 1991, that's the 205th anniversary of Frederick the Great's death. They were interred one last time. At least I hope it's the last time. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. Yes, ma'am, it's absolutely faultless. And you'll take new pride in your family's clothes the day you use faultless starts. There's no start stiffness, no start specks or globs to mar the beauty of your ironing. That's right. Faultless starch penetrates. It restores the body and beauty to all of your children's clothes, your men's shirts, your wash dresses and blouses, too. Tablecloths and napkins have the luster and finish of heavy damask. Window curtains look pert. Crisp and fresh again. Mm-hmm. And work clothes and play clothes stay clean longer and wash clean easier. Yes, you'll be proud of your family's wash when you use good old faultless starch. It's absolutely faultless. It's absolutely faultless. It's absolutely faultless, that good old faultless starch. So get faultless starch at your favorite grocery store, friends. Look for the pure white box with the big red star. That's faultless starch. Faultless starch has been granted the good housekeeping seal. That commercial for faultless starch is from the October 21st, 1952 broadcast of Faultless Starch Time with Bob Atcher and Mary Jane Johnson. The show's format was quite simple. Talk about faultless starch, sing a song, talk about faultless starch, and keep repeating that sequence for 15 minutes. Faultless starch was introduced back in 1887 and is still sold by the Faultless Starch Bonamy Company. That's the same people that brought us the infamous Garden Weasel. While I don't know many people that still buy spray starch, I do own a can. Oddly, I've walked by the same can for a couple of years now and I never noticed that it said Faultless Starch on it. And then I heard this commercial and I went to go to bed and I was getting changed. I looked down at the can and it said faultless starch on it. Never noticed it before. And now for a few totally useless yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for what I like to call news of the weird past. Our first story of it today has to do with a little bit of dental revenge. That is getting even with your dentist for all the pain and suffering he or she has ever caused you. On December 11th of 1952, Dr. Davis S. Harris, a dentist who had been practicing in Yukon, Oklahoma for 11 years, announced that he would allow the highest bidder to pull out his lower wisdom tooth. He was doing it all to raise money for charity. He did have two conditions, however. First, a professional had to administer anesthesia. There was just no way he's going to have his tooth removed without it. And second, 
it had to be done after Christmas because, quote, I don't want to have a sore jaw for Christmas. Our second tidbit appeared in the press on November 9th of 1959, and it told of the latest unusual product that was being shown at the National Barber Show in New York City. Diana Tesla, the president of the company that made toupees, was introducing a new line of, get this, chest tapestries. You're probably like, what? A chest what? A chest tapestry, or a chest toupee, or a chest rug, or a chest falsy, whatever you want to call it. It was a falsy for men that lacked ample amounts of chest hair. It was made of real imported hair, and Ms. Tessa claimed that they were purchased mostly by scrawny guys and that the most popular shade was brown. And our last story for today also has to do with falsies, but this time for women. It was reported on June 18th of 1970 that female runners in London were warned by the Amateur Athletic Association that they were no longer allowed to pad their bras. The reason it supposedly gave these women an unfair advantage in track competitions. Miss Maria Hartman, who was secretary for the association, stated, quote, We think that it's high time that built-up curves are ruled out of international women's racing. She added, Some of our flat-chested girls have not been too pleased with some of the photo finish decisions which have gone against them. One sprinter, whose name was Valerie Pete, she came in third in the previous year's 200-meter run at the European Games. She was certain that she would have placed second if her bust had been bigger. Ms. Hartman said that, quote, we want to be sure that the real girls, not the padded ones, win in any tight finish. And now for the answer to today's question of the day. And I had asked you what was Captain Crunch's full name. Your choices were one, Christopher Columbus Crunch, two, Ferdinand Erickson Crunch, three, Horatio Magellan Crunch, four, Hudson LaSalle Crunch, or five, Matthew Joliet Crunch. So which one did you choose? The answer is choice three, Horatio Magellan Crunch. Captain Crunch started back in 1962. That's when cereal manufacturer Quaker Oats was looking for something to compete with Kellogg's successful Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound product tie-ins. So the company hired legendary animator Jay Ward. He was the producer of Rocky and Bullwinkle, Dudley Do-Right, and George of the Jungle, and he was hired to develop a concept for a new kid's cereal. The marketing plan was developed before the cereal was formulated. That task fell on the shoulders of Pamela Ward. She spent 30 years as a flavorist for the Arthur D. Little consulting firm. Her inspiration came from a delicious mixture of butter and brown sugar that a grandmother served over rice while she was young. Ms. Ward, who passed away in 2007, described the flavor as, quote, want moorishness. The cereal was launched in 1963 with that successful campaign that Jay Ward's team had put together. It was so successful, in fact, that Quaker Oats had to build a new plant just to keep up with demand in 1964. Recently, the editors of the food blog Food Beast claimed that Captain Crunch was not a captain. Instead, they said he was a commander. I feel ripped off. So how did they know this? They counted the stripes on his uniform. Three stripes makes you a commander. Four stripes makes you a captain. So the U.S. Navy played along. They commented that while he was indeed wearing a commander's uniform, they had no record of his service. Another spokesman said that they referred it to NCIS for further investigation. Clearly, this is all done in fun. I hope you enjoyed today's story as well as all the supporting materials. Uh, if you'd like to read more true stories just like these, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Both are written by me, Steve Silverman, and they're available from your local bookseller online and, of course, from your local library. Well, I figured I'd end by telling you a little bit about my invention. Uh, those who have followed this podcast on and off, I've mentioned my inventions, but I haven't been very clear as to what it is. I've actually been avoiding that. 
Uh, anyway, in a few days, I'm leaving for Las Vegas. It's my first time there, and I'll be exhibiting the prototype of my invention at SuperZoo, which is a trade show for the pet industry. If you'd like to see what my invention is, just go to expandableuniverse.com. It's one word, expandableuniverse.com. And what this is, it's the first expandable cage for birds, small animals, and reptiles. It's kind of like a connects kit. You have a corner connector and a bar. You lock it together. You build a frame, and then you put the panels on the outside, whether you want screens or plexiglass or uh, real glass, whatever you want to put on the outside, you can. It allows you to customize the cage for your animal and to let it grow and grow and grow. Honestly, one of my biggest complaints, one of the things that bother me the most about cages is they're very, very confined. This allows you to start small, and then if you think your animal's confined, you can buy more pieces and expand it bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, the uh, big uh, cage that I'll be exhibiting at SuperZoo, it stands 7 feet tall, it's 9 feet wide, and between 2 to 5 feet deep, it varies. And that will be the back of my uh, booth, and it is actually one cage for if you want a parakeet or a cockatiel or your hamster or your gerbil or a small reptile. It's not meant for the big, big animals. I mean, they could just bust out of this thing. Uh, it is a prototype, so it's not for sale. And if you look at the website, there's a good description, but the photograph isn't that great because I couldn't get the big units into any of my photographs very well. Anyway, I hope you take a look at it uh, if you're curious. Um, and I hope it goes well at uh, SuperZoo. And I will planning on doing another podcast in a month, and I'll let you know how it went. Bye.